Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video, we are going to take a deeper look at the posterior pituitary. So we covered this in our last video on the relationship between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, but one of our big main takeaways from that lesson is that the hypothalamus communicates with both lobes of the pituitary, both the anterior side and the posterior side, but the way in which it communicates with those two lobes is totally different. So since this video is going to be dedicated to the posterior pituitary and the hormones it secretes, we'll focus on that for now. So what we saw in the last video as it pertains to the posterior side of the pituitary is that when the hypothalamus does communicate with it, it does so by extending axons all the way through the infundibulum into the posterior pituitary and then the axon terminals of those neurons whose cell bodies are up in the hypothalamus whose axons go through the infundibulum the axon terminals are in the posterior pituitary and are synapsing on blood vessels and are ready to release what we call neurohormones. These are hormones released by neurons directly into the bloodstream. So the release mechanism is very similar to what we're eventually going to see when we talk about neurotransmission in the nervous system unit, but because these signaling molecules are being secreted into the bloodstream that makes them hormones so we call them neurohormones to kind of indicate the uh, dichotomy of well these are neurons that are secreting hormones okay so you get that at this point so kind of the big takeaway here is that when we're talking about posterior pituitary hormones these are hormones that are secreted it uh, excuse me are synthesized up in the hypothalamus and the various nuclei up there but are secreted from the posterior pituitary okay so we talked about the presence of these different nuclei within the hypothalamus as it pertains to the posterior pituitary there are two nuclei that we need to focus on so the first is called the paraventricular nucleus, which you can see right here. This is a collection of neuron cell bodies up in the hypothalamus, and these cell bodies are synthesizing the hormone oxytocin, which we have talked about several times before. The other nucleus we will talk about is called the supraoptic nucleus. So it's over here, and it is going to consist of neurons that are synthesizing a very, very, very similar hormone in terms of structure, but this hormone is going to act very differently. And this hormone is called antidiuretic hormone, which we may have mentioned once or twice before. So what you can see is that these nuclei, each synthesizing a different hormone, they will synthesize these hormones ahead of time. And then the directional arrows that you're seeing here show that from the time these hormones are synthesized through transcription and translation, remember these are peptide hormones, so we have to go through the central dogma in order to make these hormones. Once these peptides are synthesized and made, they are transported down through the inside of the axon. So these hormones are still inside the neuron at this point. They are transported down through the axons of these neurons, down through the infundibulum, and then these hormones are held in what we might think of as a holding pattern in the end of the axon of these neurons. And then what's going to be necessary is that we get the proper stimulus, the proper signal that says we need these hormones. That will be detected by the hypothalamus, and then through neuronal signaling, the hypothalamus will trigger the release of these hormones from the axon terminals down here and into the blood supply that you see here. And then from there, antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin can circulate throughout the body and do whatever it is they need to do. Okay, so uh, I snipped off a little bit of that uh, kind of study guide that I showed you last time just to focus on the posterior pituitary. You can see the idea that you have the hypothalamus up here. You have a neuron belonging to one of those two nuclei here. You have the axon of this neuron going through the infundibulum down to the posterior pituitary. And then we can secrete one of our two hormones, either oxytocin or anti-diuretic uh, hormone. It's listed as AVP here. We'll get to that here in a minute. We'll, uh, we'll talk about how uh, anti-diuretic hormone does have an alternative name. So we'll get to that here in a minute. 
So the idea here is that these hormones are synthesized in the cell bodies of neurons in the hypothalamic nuclei. They are transported through that axon down through the infundibulum, and then they're released from the posterior pituitary proper. Now, an interesting discussion that I think we need to have about the posterior pituitary is the question of, is it really an endocrine gland? Is the posterior pituitary really endocrine in nature? We can use the Latin term bona fide here. Is it really a true endocrine gland? So in order for us to actually call it a bona fide endocrine gland, two things have to be true about it. Number one, that tissue, in this case the posterior pituitary, has to release at least one hormone into the bloodstream. Okay, well clearly it does. So the posterior pituitary releases oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone into the bloodstream. But the sticky wicket is going to be the next one. That tissue must have also been responsible for the synthesis of that or those hormones. And that is what's going to trip up the posterior pituitary here. Ask yourself the question based on what we just got done discussing. Did the posterior pituitary cells actually make oxytocin and actually make antidiuretic hormone? And the answer is no. Those two hormones, you will recall, are synthesized up here in the hypothalamus, up in those two different nuclei, the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. So this is why the posterior pituitary is not actually an endocrine gland. You can think of it as kind of an extension of the hypothalamus, but we cannot factually say that the posterior pituitary is really endocrine in nature. It did not make those hormones. It is just acting as a means to an end to get those hormones into the bloodstream. So embryologically, we're not really going to cover very much developmental biology in this class, but embryologically, if you think about how your entire body develops, you have basically three different tissue layers that then differentiate and develop into all the different organs and different parts of your body. So you have the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. So what we're going to see here is that the posterior pituitary is derived from a completely different tissue layer than the anterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is related to the tissue layer that also gives rise to the brain and the spinal cord and all the different parts of the nervous system. So the posterior pituitary is basically a part of the nervous system, just like the hypothalamus. Whereas the anterior pituitary is much more closely related to the types of cells that make up the uh, tissue of the digestive tract, those cells that sec synthesize and secrete digestive enzymes and things of that nature. So we can really get a clear picture here that the posterior and anterior pituitaries are very different from one another. They are totally derived from different parts of the early developmental tissues that we could be talking about if this were a developmental biology class. So basically your big takeaway here is, is the posterior pituitary actually endocrine in nature? And the answer is no. But in the next video, when we talk about the anterior pituitary, the answer to that same question will be a resounding yes. Okay, so before we wrap up this video, let's talk just a little bit about what these two hormones that are secreted from the posterior pituitary actually do. So we've talked quite a bit about oxytocin, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time there. But both oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone are short peptide hormones. They each consist of nine amino acids. Okay, now that actually is going to bring up an interesting question, which I'll bring up here in a minute. But sticking with kind of the theme of being really concerned with the chemical properties of the hormones we're going to talk about, both of these are peptide hormones. They are both very soluble in aqueous solutions. So as we learned in a previous lesson, that's going to allow us to accurately predict the location of their receptors. So any cells in the body that have oxytocin receptors or antidiuretic hormone receptors, we can be pretty confident those receptors are going to be cell surface receptors. Those are membrane bound receptors. Oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone can't move through the membrane, so those are going to be membrane receptors. Okay, so quick question about oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone that I'll go ahead and bring up now. I think maybe I bring this up again later, but I'll go ahead and ask it now. 
if oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone are both peptide hormones and they both contain the same number of amino acids, well, why don't they do exactly the same thing? Why do they produce completely different effects on their target cells? And hopefully you'll remember everything you learned about protein biochemistry back in unit one, but the reason they don't do the same thing, even though they contain the same number of amino acids, is obviously because they contain the, a different sequence of amino acids. So if that idea doesn't quite sit right with you, I would recommend you go back and spend a little time reviewing our lessons on peptides, peptide bond formation, and protein folding. Okay, so as far as oxytocin is concerned, we saw back in chapter one that oxytocin is a critical component of the childbirth process. So the whole idea here is that when a baby is ready to be born at the end of the nine month gestation process, the baby is going to start placing pressure on the cervix, which contains sensory receptors that are sensitive to the pressure that the baby is putting on it. This is going to activate a spinal nerve reflex in which this afferent signal is going to go up through the spinal cord up to the hypothalamus and the hypothalamus is going to sense that pressure being placed on the cervix and then coordinate the release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. That oxytocin will get into the bloodstream. It will stimulate the smooth muscle layer of the uterus. We call that the myometrium and that is going to produce contractions that will push the baby even further into the birth canal and that's going to place even more pressure on the cervix and that plays a critical part of the positive feedback mechanism that will ensure that this baby is going to be born. So we covered this quite a lot back in chapter one. If you need more review on this, I would suggest going back and reviewing your chapter one videos. But for now, since we're talking about hormones in particular, I would encourage you to think about this question. Which particular cells or tissue in this reflex are or is most likely to have oxytocin receptors? I already kind of gave it away. If you didn't hear me say it, I would rewind the video 15 or 30 seconds and listen to me say it again. It is, I, I cannot stress this enough. It is very, very, very important for any particular hormonal reflex or hormonal pathway or hormonal mechanism that you have a good understanding of which cells in that pathway have the receptors for that particular hormone. That is the only way you are going to completely understand and completely grasp how the different parts of the pathway complement one another and lead to completion of the pathway. Okay. So just a couple of other tidbits about oxytocin. So oxytocin receptors are only produced in the uterus in the lead up to childbirth. So a non-pregnant woman actually does not have any oxytocin receptors in her uterine cells or on her uterine cells, I should say. So this, answer, this answers the question of, well, I mean, you probably know that oxytocin is sometimes called the love hormone, which we'll talk about here in a second. So you might be, you might've been wondering, well, if oxytocin is getting secreted all the time, why doesn't it cause my uterus, well, not my uterus, I'm a man, but a woman's uterus to contract all the time? And the answer there is that a woman's uterus does not always have oxytocin receptors. It's only after a woman becomes pregnant that those cells actually start producing and expressing oxytocin receptors. Oxytocin is also going to play a major role in releasing prolactin from the anterior pituitary for breastfeeding. Of the anterior pituitary hormones, prolactin is really the only one we're not going to talk about very much, but oxytocin does play a role in stimulating milk production. It says more on that in the next lecture, but I don't think that next lecture I ended up putting much about uh, prolactin in there, so apologies for that. And then I'd mentioned this before, oxytocin is sometimes called the love hormone due to the psychological effects it really produces in us during periods of intense social bonding, forging very close relationships, romantic relationships, and things of that nature. Not just romantic relationships, but familial love and things of that nature. And it's honestly that familial love that kind of feeds back into milk production. Big reason why uh, nursing mothers can produce milk very well is that they're very responsive to the cries of their newborn child child and that stimulates the production of oxytocin that aids in the release of prolactin so that you can get that baby fed.
Okay, so let's wrap up this video with a quick discussion on antidiuretic hormone. This is sometimes also called arginine vasopressin, so that's the origin of that AVP acronym that I showed you before. So it's sometimes called arginine vasopressin because this peptide does contain an arginine in its amino acid sequence, whereas oxytocin did not. So antidiuretic hormone has two major functions. The first that we've actually talked about before is that it stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb water into the blood in basically periods of dehydration. This is a way to decrease the blood's osmolarity because when you're dehydrated, your blood's osmolarity is too high. There's too much solute and not enough water. So in this case, antidiuretic hormones helps to stave off the negative consequences of dehydration. We don't want our cells exposed to hypertonic environments because they will go through crenation. The second function, which you can kind of uh, interpret from its alternate name, vasopressin, Antidiuretic hormone can also stimulate arterial vasoconstriction as a means of increasing blood pressure. If you're not quite sure how vasoconstriction would increase blood pressure at this point, that's okay. We're going to talk about blood pressure concepts in Unit 4 in the far-flung future. So if that doesn't quite click with you right now, don't worry about that one bit. We will cover that sort of stuff in the future, I promise. Okay, so I've shown you this uh, homeostasis loop before, so this is just review. Uh, this is the reflex involving antidiuretic hormones stimulating increased water reabsorption in the kidneys, and we'll cover this mechanism in greater detail in Unit 5 when we actually learn about kidney function and all that. But the idea here is that your stimulus is when the blood osmolarity gets too high, osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus sense that osmolarity being too high in the extracellular fluid, we coordinate the release of antidiuretic hormone from the posterior pituitary. It goes through the bloodstream and stimulates cells in the kidneys that have those antidiuretic hormone receptors to start reabsorbing more water. And that should help to prevent us from getting any more dehydrated than we already are. So excess water is constantly getting filtered out of the blood by the kidneys. So if you're dehydrated, you're going to eventually end up with a problem where there's hardly any water left in your blood. So what we're doing here is we're instructing the kidneys to preserve water by telling them, okay, you guys are usually taking water out of the blood. Why don't you guys stop doing that until we can kind of get, uh, get things figured out on our end? Okay, so here's some uh, vocabulary terms you probably want to be aware of. And then for checking your understanding after this lesson, Number one, which test of being a true endocrine gland does the posterior pituitary fail and why? And number two, briefly describe the major functions of these two posterior pituitary hormones. I think you should have absolutely no problem answering these two questions if you paid close attention to this video. Okay, that's going to do it for this video. I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions whatsoever, drop them in the comments section, and I will see you next time. So long.